Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, the Minnesota DFL party chair makes the case for voting for the Democrats in November. The DNR commissioner talks about fall colors, rice harvesting, and other ways to get outside in the great outdoors this fall. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. With the November election fast approaching, we continue to bring you the perspectives of legislative and party leaders. Minnesota, now considered by many analysts to be a swing state, last supported a Republican presidential candidate in 1972. This week, I spoke with the chair of the Minnesota DFL party, Ken Martin, and I began by asking him if the Biden-Harris ticket can win in Minnesota. I think the answer to that is yes. Of course, uh, with 42 days left, uh, anything can happen. So, you know, if polls were 100% accurate, we'd be having a different conversation right now. We'd be talking about Hillary Clinton's reelection. So the reality is, is as my old mentor and friend, Paul Wellstone used to say, we run like we're 20 points behind, even if we're 20 points ahead. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't trade our position with the Republicans right now on all accounts, whether it's the ground game, the air, air game in terms of the number of ads that we're running, uh, the conversations we're having with voters. Certainly all signs point to a victory on November 3rd, but we're gonna continue to work uh, like we're uh, behind. Now look, it shouldn't surprise anyone given the 2016 election results here that Minnesota is a critical battleground. Uh, Donald Trump uh, and the Republicans have put uh, Minnesota in the crosshairs. Uh, and when you think about Donald Trump, he's a little bit of a trophy collector. He collects trophy wives, trophy properties. Uh, there's no bigger trophy for a Republican running for president than to flip Minnesota, which has the longest streak of any of voting for the Democratic presidential nominee. So we expect a, a really uh, busy next 42 days with uh, lots of principal visits by both uh, sides, lots of money and time spent in this state uh, by both uh, campaigns. And it's gonna be a crazy ride. The death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and now the sudden vacancy on the Supreme Court has the potential to energize both Democrats and Republicans in this election. Do you believe that her death will impact Minnesota races? Well, I, I you know, at this point, it's certainly an unknown. I will tell you that uh, in the days since uh, Justice Ginsburg passed away, we've seen uh, an outpouring of support uh, from both donors and volunteers. Uh, on our side who are really um, uh, concerned about what this means for the future of this country and in particular concerned uh, about issues like the Affordable Care Act. And as you know, uh, that uh, is a critical um, a program that really hangs in the balance that the courts could decide on. And no one in this state or in this country wants to go back to the days when those with pre-existing uh, conditions were not covered by health insurance or where young people had to go without uh, health care, where we didn't have accessible or affordable health care throughout this country and we had uh, premiums skyrocketing. The reality is, is that I think most folks understand the consequences of a court that has been completely packed by Republicans and by conservatives and what impact it would have on their lives. And that's why you've seen the type of outpouring of support that we've seen since Justice Ginsburg's death. As you know, all 201 legislative seats are up for grabs in November. The Senate Republicans currently hold the majority, 35-32. The House is controlled by the DFL by a larger margin, 75 to 59. What is the DFL message that will enable the party to gain control of the Senate, maintain control of the House, and with Governor Walls in the executive office, have complete control of Minnesota's government next year? Well, the message is simple. Uh, here in Minnesota, we pride ourselves on having one of the best education systems in the country. Uh, but because of Republicans in the legislature over the years, both when they were in the majorities, but also now uh, when they continue to stand in the way of education funny, funding, we have slipped in this state and slipped quite dramatically. There was a time and a day when Republicans and Democrats came together to actually address issues like education. In fact, the Minnesota miracle, which passed in uh, 1970, wasn't just passed by Democrats. It was Republicans as well who understood that if we wanted to be more than just a cold sort of flyover state, we had to invest in education and invest in a world-class education system. And for years, both Republicans and Democrats did that 
But now in recent years, the Republicans have been obstinate and intransigent on that issue. The reality is, as Minnesotans over the course of our history as a state have wanted divided government more than they wanted one party control. And the idea was that by having divided government, it would result in a better outcome for Minnesotans. Both sides will be forced to come together and figure out solutions to the issues that Minnesotans faced. But that's not working that way anymore. And just uh, recent examples of that uh, in the last legislative session where you didn't see a bonding bill passed by Republicans, uh, which, you know, unfortunately has cost uh, us thousands of uh, jobs in this state and also investments in critical infrastructure projects that many communities throughout Minnesota have been waiting years uh, to, to have uh, taken place. So, you know, the reality is, is it's those issues that I think are really frustrating right now when you have divided government and one side who's drawn a line in the sand and refusing to do even the basic sort of core functions of government that we've always relied on here in this state, like funding our education system and passing bonding bills. The only way, unfortunately, that's going to be solved is by making sure that we put DFLers in control of government. The last time that we had complete control of government in 2012 to 2014, we saw an amazing amount of legislation passing that actually moved the ball forward for Minnesotans. It helped improve people's lives and it helped strengthen our communities throughout the state. That's really what it's going to take, unfortunately. You know, I, I know Minnesotans want divided government, but divided government is not working for them or for their families. In an email to J. Patrick Kulikin of the Daily Reformer, former DFL Senate leader Tom Bach from the Iron Range said, quote, Democratic operatives have moved on to more ideological issues and it resonates with fewer rural people, end quote. According to Bach, it isn't that Northeast Minnesota has moved right, but rather that the DFL talks less about labor and jobs blue collar jobs, that is, and that losing your job in a rural area can have a dire impact on a family than, than in a metro area. So can the DFL win rural Minnesota, Minnesota votes generally and Iron Range votes specifically? Well, look, I mean, uh, there's a lot to unpack in what uh, Senator ba Bach said there, but there is a, a lot that I agree with, and in particular, uh, a focus on the economy and jobs. Uh, uh, as Rudy Perpich used to say famously, uh, it's all about the jobs, 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 and uh, really focusing in on the fact that uh, our party has always been in favor of job creation and in favor of unions and in favor of blue collar workers and making sure that people are supported in this state. And, you know, it's one thing uh, that someone like Paul Wellstone, who is a progressive, also understood what what's the, uh, unites a, a, a corn and soybean farmer in southern Minnesota and an iron ranger in, in northeastern Minnesota and an immigrant in the uh, inner cities. It's this idea of the, Ameri uh, of the American dream, the idea that if you work hard and play by the rules, you should be able to build a better life for yourself and your family and, and leave your family uh, better off than, than, than where you started. And, and that American dream is the underpinning, I think, of what's always made this country great. And a big focus of that is making sure that we focus on those bread and butter issues that are really drive anxiety in this uh, country right now amongst people, not just in greater Minnesota, but throughout the state. It's uh, jobs and the economy. It's health care, of course. It's, it's people worrying about how they send their, uh, their kids off to college and, and afford it. Those are the issues that are giving people heartburn. And while we tend to focus on a lot of the controversial issues, the reality is, is it's those kitchen table issues that ultimately are going to decide this election, uh, and they always do. And I, I, I agree with, uh, wholeheartedly with Senator Bach that we, we as a party need to continue to focus on those issues, those kitchen table issues that, that people are talking about with their family members. The civil unrest that followed the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the defund the police mantra that followed, and then the uptick in violent crime that's happened over the summer have prompted Republican candidates to really emphasize their party's support for law enforcement and a law and order platform. What is the DFL position on public safety? Well, I think you saw that in the legislative session. It was DFLers who actually put forward a number of uh, bills to make sure that uh, our public safety system actually worked on behalf of the people that it was it's it's supposed to I don't know uh, many DFLers uh, that uh, favor uh, abolishing the police or even defunding the police I think most of the DFLers in the legislature and frankly most DFL elected officials in this state 
believe that we need to uh, strengthen uh, our public safety and we need to reimagine our public safety. We need to make sure that the, our, uh, our policing and all other uh, forms of public safety are actually working in the best interest of the people that they're supposed to protect and serve. And so when we talk about reimagining public safety, we're talking about making sure that we have more mental health professionals on the police force, right? That we have more social workers on the police force because not every incident that uh, the police are called into requires um, uh, a, a, a sort of uh, violent uh, interaction or any sort of um, uh, altercation, right? Oftentimes we need those uh, situations to be de-escalated and diffused and having people who are trained in that and people who understand that from a, a social worker perspective or a mental health perspective is what's needed on police force, uh, police forces around this uh, state. The, the DFL stands with law enforcement, uh, but we also realize that there is a, a real need to make sure that we don't see any more black men murdered in the street by the police. We need to make sure that there's reform and accountability. And that's what happened this summer with the, the proposals that were put forward. Um, and just briefly, I, one more question, if you can answer quickly. Critics are crying hypocrisy because peaceful protests were allowed during this COVID-19 um, environment that we're in, and yet restrictions remain on worshiping and businesses. Are you concerned about a backlash or anger and frustration um, because of how the pandemic has been handled? Well, look, Shannon, we sit here today with over 200,000 Americans who've died from this virus and a president who's knowingly lied to the American public about how dangerous this virus was from the very beginning. We need leaders in this state and country, frankly, who are going to be honest with the public and actually put uh, policies in place that will keep all of us safe and protect all of us. And while I know that these are sacrifices that all of us have to make, I trust the governor, as do many Minnesotans, if you believe uh, recent polling, trust the governor and, le and legislative leaders to make the decisions that are going to keep all of us safe. Look, we all want to get back to the day uh, of sort of normal life where we can go to church services, we can go out to sporting events, we can, we can uh, you know, go out to dinner with our friends and others. But the reality is, is right now, we're all called to a greater purpose, all of us, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent or, or none of them. We all have to realize that we have to make sacrifices at this time if we want to actually uh, beat this. You know, George Bush said this, uh, 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 over Memorial Day weekend, and I, I found it really profound, and I was not a big supporter of his, but he said, look, the differences between us right now uh, as Democrats and Republicans are so small compared to what we're facing head on. And Americans have always faced every crisis by coming together as one people, as one country, to tackle whatever crisis we're facing head on. And that's what it's going to take. We need to, uh, to set partisanship at the door because this is not a partisan issue. We need to realize that we all have to come together in a meaningful way, make the sacrifices we're asked to if we're going to beat this virus. COVID-19 has prompted more and more Minnesotans to get outdoors. This week, I spoke with Sarah Strawman, the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, about the state of Minnesota's resources. I began by asking her if we're in danger of loving our state parks too much. We have definitely seen Minnesotans head outdoors during the pandemic. Um, in some of our parks and some of our trails, we've seen visitor use increase anywhere from 60 to nearly 200%. So uh, lots of people getting outside and, and that's a good thing. We want Minnesotans outside. We want them enjoying our parks. Uh, it's good for us, you know, it helps keep us healthy. Um, but certainly uh, there have been times where we've had um, issues with too many people, particularly um, our parking lots have been full. And, and at those times we have suggested to people that if you get to a state park and the parking lot is full, that's probably a sign that the park is about at its capacity. And so maybe try somewhere else. Uh, we suggested that people plan to go at um, lesser use times. And then, you know, rem reminding people to pack out their trash too, take 
take home what you bring in or make sure it gets in a trash receptacle, those kinds of things. Um, but really, we're, we're glad that people are, are out using the parks as long as I think um, people apply a little bit of, of patience and grace with each other and with, with our staff, um, we'll all be able to enjoy the outdoors. Now, leaf peeping season has begun in Minnesota. The DNR has a great fall color finder app that you can or web. You, you can go to the website. You can also sign up for updates in your email. There's suggestions for fall color drives by DNR foresters. What else can people do to get out in nature this fall? Yeah, fall is one of Minnesota's best seasons. Maybe I'm biased, but for me it is. Um, I mean, the fall color tours are great. I, I know they're brilliant. People have been sending me photos. I haven't quite been up north yet. Um, the maples even in my yard here are starting to turn. But there's so many things um, to do in the fall. You know, hiking um, along one of the trails uh, that we have in Minnesota, whether it's your local trail or state trail, um, fall fishing is a fabulous time to be out. The lakes aren't as busy, so that's great. ATVing, people enjoy doing in the fall. And something that I know my son is enjoying doing this fall is mountain biking. And we have great places to mountain bike this year. Um, you know, you mentioned hiking, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit because the DNR is using an app developed by Avenza that provides GeoPDF maps, and you don't even need to have a cell signal to get them, I think, so that you don't get lost. And I noticed that you've tried this. I'm gonna try it this weekend. Are you hearing good things? We are hearing good things. It's, uh, it's really a fabulous tool. It's super easy to use. I uh, just recently went, I, I downloaded the Avenza app onto my phone and then you can pick um, from the menu the, the maps that you want for various parks or forests. So um, I recently tried it in the Paul Bunyan State Forest. I downloaded the map and, you know, sure enough, uh, you can have that map right on your phone and, and a blue dot uh, follows your path. And so you can see right where in the forest you are. And uh, so very easy to use, great tool. I, I encourage you to give it a try and I'll be curious to hear what you think of it, Shannon. <laughs> so I'd like to turn to um, something on the Minnesota wolf population. The DNR is about to undertake an update of its management plan for wolves. A public comment period is about to open. There will be virtual public meetings in the next couple weeks. What is the goal in revising the state's management plan for wolves? Yeah, well, really the goal for um, revising the management plan is to have a plan that reflects the current context that we're in today. The current plan that we operate under was done in 2001. So really, um, it's quite dated now. The wolf population in Minnesota has changed. People's experience with wolves and, and how they view um, Minnesota wolves has changed. And so updating the plan is an opportunity to reflect that change context and to make sure that we have then a plan that is guiding our management that is, is relevant to um, today's time. And that plan really is what guides a, a wide range of management actions from our monitoring of the wolf population to research that we might undertake, as well as then actual management um, of the population, depending on you know, what options we have available to us, depending on federal status. So um, really important that folks um, take advantage of the public input opportunities so that we can hear from folks um, regarding their opinions about wolves in Minnesota and what you know, monitoring, research, and management tools they think are important for us to have in that plan. The archery deer hunting season is underway, underway currently and uh, firearms deer season is around the corner. Is this likely to be a good deer hunting season? Yeah, you know, I'm always careful to promise a good hunting season because that's probably uh, a jinx. But um, I think that folks will find um, really good opportunities for deer hunting this year. Our deer population is um, stable or increasing in many parts of the state. Um, we have increased opportunity in many deer population, many of our deer population um, units, and partly because of the chronic wasting disease and wanting to reduce deer densities, particularly in the southeastern part of the state, there's increased opportunities for deer hunting there as well. So I, I'm hopeful that um, people will, will, you know, have that opportunity. Um, but as deer hunters, we know it's, it's about the experience, not just about the take. And we are expecting that deer um, hunting participation may be up this year as well, like we're seeing with 
um, park use and fishing license sales and those kinds of things. Already we're seeing an uptick in our sales of archery licenses. So um, there may be a few more people out in the woods uh, come firearm season, but, but that's a good thing too, that people are, are getting out and taking advantage of that opportunity. Now, wild rice harvesting season ends uh, on September 30th very soon, but I noticed on Twitter that you tried to harvest rice for the first time this year. How did that go? Uh, it was an amazing experience, Shannon. I was so glad that I did it. And it's something that I have wanted to try for a while. Um, I, I am a big fan of eating wild rice. And so I thought I should experience the, the work that goes into that. Um, it's also, you know, from a, a cultural and spiritual standpoint, really important to the Ojibwe and Dakota communities here in Minnesota. And it's an important resource for which we manage at DNR. So um, I wanted to get out and, and have that part of the experience. And I will tell you, it is a great way to get really up close and personal with nature. When you are in that canoe, out in those thick rice beds, uh, harvesting that rice, watching it fall into the canoe, uh, it's, it's not easy work. It's, it's hard work and it's messy, but it really was an amazing experience to be out there. And, and I look forward to trying it again. Now, no conversation with you is complete without talking about fishing. Uh, I understand that there will be a full fall season for walleye fishing on Mille Lacs, making many anglers happy. But in general, how are our fish? Yeah, well, um, fish, the fish populations generally are good. And, and we're glad that we're able to get through the fall season on Mille Lacs. And, and many other lakes are going to offer great fall fishing heard from a lot of folks uh, who, who enjoy that. I know in my house, we, we love the fall fishing. So uh, it's really a good time to take advantage of those angling opportunities. I think one of the things that we'll need to be mindful of for the future is if we continue to have increased people out fishing, which again is a good thing we wanna do that, that does create additional pressure on our fish resources. And so we'll wanna make sure that we're paying attention to that and finding a balance between people getting out and enjoying that activity and making sure that we have stable populations for the long term. Commissioner Strauman, it's always so fun to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here and talk with you as well. We close this week's program with a look at a unique aspect of the Minnesota Capitol from our series, The People's House. The state capitol Rathskeller is sort of a time capsule from 1905 when the building was built. What is the history of this impressive basement room? Yeah, this is a really significant part of Cass Gilbert's envision or visioning of these spaces. And it's uh, unique because it's a German Rathskeller, so it's patterned after something you would find in a German public hall. The tradition is they debate upstairs and then at the end of the day they come down and have a few drinks, talk to each other, so there's a camaraderie and a fellowship. So it's kind of a day, a place to unwind after a busy day. So there's that, you know, the German immigration, that was our largest immigration group, has been throughout our history of a state. And so that is a nice nod to the German heritage, but also to kind of impart that uh, tradition of a German public space and a place to gather uh, below ground. The combination of anti-German sentiment and prohibition had a big effect on the Raskeller. What happened? That really was a, a key event in how you would have seen this building and this space in particular after the World War I began. So it was kind of a double whammy, a, a two-edged sword for the Raskeller because it has a lot of uh, drinking slogans written in German. So now we're fighting a war against Germany. Plus there was a lot of strong prohibition forces. So you have German drinking slogans, which is not a good combination for what people saw as a, a place to bring the public down to or be a part of that uh, establishment. So this entire ceiling, all the walls were whitewashed. Everything was painted white. And that was the tradition for uh, many, many years. There was a time in the 30s when Governor Theodore Christensen painted some of the slogans back in. And then we're not sure why that got covered up again a few years after that. And it wasn't until we did the restoration of the space in 1999 that we 
brought back all the original stencils, all the drinking slogans again, to give you a sense of what it would have appeared like in 1905. How extensive was the research that needed to be done to bring it back to its original intent? Yeah, we, we did a lot of research just to understand the space a lot more. Um, that's where we never really found any evidence to say that this was you know, a governor's edict because of the war, World War I. Most of the uh, documentation we see with letters to the governor, women's auxiliary groups, was to, to kind of advocate for the prohibition, to remove the drinking slogans. But it, it's a combination of both. I think we can uh, understand that's kind of the sentiment of America at that time. Why should visitors to the Capitol come see the Rathskeller? Well, as I said before, it's a really neat space. It's uh, something you don't necessarily expect to see in the state capitol. And uh, once again, since it's been restored, 1999, it opened, reopened in 2000. It's a full service, you know, cafeteria again. So you can during eat the here. Legislative during the legislative session. During the legislative session, you can come down here and eat. And then it's also just a, a beautiful place to see that decoration. And uh, it's it's a combination of an American rascal and a German rascal because you have traditionally in a rascal in Germany you might have German eagles. Well here we have eagles that are American eagles instead of a German eagle. And then you also have two dates that are important parts of our state's history, 1849, which is the year we became a territory, 1858 we became the 32nd state. So those uh, dates were part of that original stencil. And so, there's insets as you as you walk through and see this restored space we were able to preserve some of the original stencil and so that's inset against the wall and there's a new layer of plaster on, on on the edges of that or above that that has a new stencil but throughout the space you can see these really neat uh, examples of what it looked like in 1905. The public is welcome to come down here. We have a nice little exhibit that Minnesota Historical Society put together, a little display to explain a little bit more of the history. And you can see, you know, some of what happened to this space. And, and you also discover there are 22 layers of paint on top of the original art. So there was a lot of overpainting and painting of the ceiling over time. And since the renovation in 2017, there is uh, overflow space now by the governor's dining room and the judicial dining room. Is that, is that right? Yeah, there, there's additional eating space and, and that's really a nice addition to the public as, access and usability of this space. Um, this is a, can be a noisy space when there's a lot of people here. It's a neat historic space to have lunch, but also if you want a little bit more quieter conversation or overflow, there's a, a kind of an adjunct space down the hallway that's another neat space with the reproductions of the furniture that was there, the tables and the chairs, some television. So if you want to watch the committees or the session, you can kind of keep up to date with that. So as part of the restoration project, it's a really important part of what we do here and how the public can use the spaces. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.